So I want to thank Tom and our partners at ATP Co for inviting pros to speak here. It's, um, it's a great event. I, I like the big letters. Where, where are you storing those? Store yeah. <laughs> I mean, where, where are you going to store those bad boys? So, but nevertheless, this is a fantastic conference. They've, they've really done a tremendous job rebranding and with the content. And Peter did an amazing job. I mean, he really did a lot of the hard work for me. I don't, the fact that I don't have to stand up here for, you know, and go on for another 30 minutes about dynamic pricing, he's already sort of laid it out on the degrees of one to six. And so I really appreciate that. And I'll, I'll reference that later on. So. Dynamic pricing for airline modern commerce. So those of you who don't know Pros, I promised my marketing manager that I would show this slide. Um, I joined Pros about 12 years ago. I never worked at an airline, never didn't know much about airlines, never flown anywhere. I was, you know, a poor kid from Dallas that was in graduate school, just finished my PhD, and I found this kind of startup technology company in Houston. And I went, oh, that's great. I don't have to move to California and pay really high cost of living but I get that nice tech startup feel here in my own backyard in Texas. So we started out actually as a consulting company by ex-executives from an airline called Texas International. Anybody remember that one? It was a husband and wife team, Ron and uh, Marriott Westermeyer, and we were two employees. Our first product was an overbooking module for Southwest Airlines back in about 1987, and then we've grown to a pretty big company, and we've gotten bigger recently. Um, these are accurate statistics, I promise. So back in about July, we announced the acquisition of Byant. And so anybody ever heard of Byant? Okay, great. It was really the perfect, perfect marriage, the perfect union, because we have best in breed revenue management and availability with best in breed shopping. And the reason why we did this is you know, if we rewind about five years, we had a vision for where we wanted the airline industry to go, in terms of revenue management, that is. We felt that, if you recall Peters, when he went through his sort of hierarchy, or I didn't say hierarchy, but his list of dynamic pricing, we were kind of at a one and a two. We were doing really, really good dynamic availability, meaning given the passenger's point of sale, their itinerary, all sorts of characteristics about, you know, their frequent flyer tier, we could create availability for them. In real time, we could do it very, very fast at very, very high volume. So to Manish's point, it is very important to be linear, scalable, and to have sub-second response times. So we were doing that for a very long time, but we felt like the industry was missing out, missing out on something. And so we started looking around, and it, it really the need came when we have a product called Group Sales Optimizer, which is dynamic pricing for groups. We felt like that's where we should start, because the group business is it's important, but it's also much smaller in terms of scale compared to others, right? So it could be the perfect test bed to trial dynamic pricing. And when I say dynamic pricing, I have a, a definition later I'll show, but on Peter's scale, the Peter scale, if I'll refer to it now, it's a six, a five and a six. And so we needed a company to help us accelerate this vision for individuals as well. And so it was actually at the dynamic pricing working group in February of 2015 and Tom is shaking his head because not only is he an excellent uh, conference, but put on a great show, he's also a matchmaker because he you know, invited us 87 people in a big room here in DC, and that's when I happened to meet a really tall guy who looks like he could have been a, a villain in a James Bond film named Boyne, who was the head of product management at Viant. Um, he has the most beautiful set of white hair. When you see him, you'll know, you say, hey, it's Boyne. But we met and we started talking and went, wow, this is, it started, the relationship started blossoming. So sure enough, the acquisition happened. And so it really marries perfect revenue management with shopping, pricing, merchandising capabilities to really accelerate dynamic pricing. That was the whole point of the acquisition. Okay, so what is it? I, I don't disagree with, at all with Peter's definitions of dynamic pricing, by the way. I think they're excellent. And we have a slightly modified version, I would say, of a, of dynamic pricing. What we mean is pricing that decouples price from availability. So when you start to decouple, what does it mean to decouple? You break apart, right? They become independent. Well, availability wouldn't stand on its own. So what this essentially means is dynamic pricing need not have availability. That's what dynamic pricing means to pros. It can be achieved in many, many different ways. We don't disagree with that, right? And it has been achieved in many ways 
for several years now with pros and our customers. Um, it doesn't mean fair families won't exist. It doesn't mean classes won't exist. There will always be some sort of product ID. I think we can all agree with that, right? You're purchasing something, you're contracting for something, so we have to, in order to fulfill that contract, it has to have a label. We just don't want to have it limited to 26 labels, that is, where, or which extends to fair basis codes, et cetera. We need not, so class availability need not exist for dynamic pricing. It may exist in certain markets. Certain markets may call for continuous pricing, whereas other markets, it may not be a good fit, right? There are studies that show under certain competitive scenarios in certain markets that having a discrete set of price points is not a bad thing. Okay, so I wanna show you some screenshots because I, I just, I want you to come away from here that dynamic pricing is not a myth. Is that yes, it's, it's existed in many forms and shapes, but this screen is actually, it's real production software and it has been since 2013. These prices are not pre-filed. Right? If you went to ATPCO, you wouldn't find these fares. Right? They're created in real time using science, right? with estimates about you know, expected revenue, expected demand, um, characteristics of the travel agent, characteristics of the group that's traveling. It's real production software. And we can generate terms to it. We can change the terms. So we started with groups because we felt like that was the right place to do it. But now is the time to obviously continue forward. So we do have technology today to extend that to individual passengers. In fact, we have customers in production with it right now. I can't say their names, <laughs> right? I would definitely be crucified for that. But it exists. And there, are, it, but it, does, it doesn't have to exist in a certain way. I, I agree that we can skin this cat a lot of different ways, and that's why I'm so excited to see the pilots that Sabre and ATPCO and Pros are working on, because we don't believe it's a one size fits all. We think that in certain distribution channels may require, unique, have unique needs. And so, but you know, for an IBE, there's a lot more flexibility. And with groups, there's a lot more flexibility. But when we're working with GDSs, it may be a little bit differently. I wanna give you some statistics. Um, don't worry about the map. I have to you know, lead you astray here with some points, all right? So you're guessing, well, who's that, all right? But <clears throat> there is another myth. I should have named this talk the 10 myths about dynamic pricing. It's like a throwback to Bill Brunger. He used to have a talk about top 10 things about how the internet changed the airline business. It's a great talk if you ever see it. But there's a myth that dynamic pricing can't be rolled out in North America. It's wrong. Actually, dynamic pricing exists in North America right now. You just don't know it. It's happening. It's happening for individuals. It's happening for groups. And it's continuous pricing, too. It's not up markups or markdowns, yes, that happens too. I think that's clever. There's a, need, a time and a place for that, but it's also happening with continuous pricing. So to Peter's point, it took us about five years to overhaul the science that we had created for traditional revenue management to make it class, I don't wanna say classless, a terrible word, but um, not class-based might be a more appropriate term, right? It took us about five years to develop that science. It was very difficult. It took us working with several partners, several major airlines, a lot of data, and it, is it finished? No, it's not perfect. There's still aspects, and it's not just the forecast, it's optimization, it's everything. From the data, I mean, it was, it's painful. Um, but we have been working with ATPCO. I wanna bring that up again, because I think in certain implementations, there, there, will, there is a, definitely a need for ATPCO. It does provide some structure in the industry, and I, I'd like to see it continue. I mean, it may be the case that, I uh, probably have to be careful saying this, but maybe airlines should just file one fare, right? And we'll just mark up or mark down that fare, right? Is publish out what you think you're willing to bear for the market. Maybe call it your minimum. Maybe file two fares, a min and a max, and we'll figure out in between. I think that's another good way of going forward of implementing dynamic pricing and current sort of infrastructure. So the WIFI, right? What's in it for you? After all this talk, I'm glad that Peter, I'm glad we agree on the numbers. That's good. It's always good when you, your numbers kind of match his, right? What'd you get on that? Yeah. But these are real numbers, meaning we realize these gains. And I'm not going to, I can go through and caveat and say it was for this market, it was that. It's not to, across the total network because nobody's rolled out dynamic pricing 
at least continuous base dynamic pricing across the entire network. There's no way, not yet. But in the situations where it has been rolled out, I mean, the, the gains that we realize are, can be up to 10%. It's very impressive, right? And so it's real. I mean, the gains are real. And conversion, too. It's not just, that was to Peter's point, is that you're, you're satisfying demand from the, the demand is coming from the network, right? You're not necessarily cannibalizing your own demand. It's coming, it's additional demand from the network that you're attracting either through discounting. But the conversion is also very impressive, right? So you're making more money higher yields too, and you're converting more people to your, or more, more passengers. So it's stickier and increases brand loyalty. So if you have any questions about all of this, I'll be at the beer garden of course tonight, and we can have a fun talk about dynamic pricing, really. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>